This is episode 45 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm speaking with Carol Herder. Carol has a genuine passion for educating horse owners worldwide, especially on all matters related to natural horse keeping. Carol gives presentations and leads workshops at horse events worldwide. Carol's involvement in the study of horse health began in 1994 as a result of insurmountable health problems experienced by her beloved first horse, Rocky. It was her love for Rocky that spurred her to learn all she could about horse health and eventually to found Cavallo Horse and Rider, Inc. She went on to design the total comfort system, saddle pads, Cavallo Simple, Sport, ELB, Transporter, and Trek Hoof Boots. Carol is a certified Chopra University instructor. In 2010, she won the Royal Bank of Canada Western Division Trailblazer Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Her work is changing the world and blazing a new trail in an otherwise stagnant traditional industry. Carol is a proud member of the Women President's Organization, supporting women in business. Through her work and designs, she has served hundreds of thousands of horses and riders around the world. Providing comfort for horses is her goal. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Show. Today, I am so excited to be talking with Carol Herder. Hi, Carol. Welcome to the show. Hi, good to be here. You know, how I really like to kick these off is, you know, we're all horse lovers here. We're all equestrians. We, you know, we all love to write, but I, I love to hear how the fellow authors that I'm speaking with began their love affair with horses. Can you talk to mm-hmm. us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, true confession. Uh, I didn't grow up with horses. I'm not a vet. I'm not a farrier. I had nothing to do with them. I didn't even know anyone with horses when I was a child. I watched my friend Flicka and Black Beauty and National Geographic and drew pictures of horses, so I always loved them. My first encounter with a horse is kind of strange because I was about eight years old and we grew up in the city, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And we were on a drive on a country road after church, waiting to go to my grandma's for lunch. And it was one of those beautiful spring days, you know, and it was just bursting with life. And we're driving kind of slowly a- along and off in the distance, there's this beautiful horse on a knoll on a hill. <laughs> and I, something possessed me and I'm like, stop the car, dad, stop the car. And he screeches to a halt. And I jump out and I go running to the fence. And it's like, you know, most horses would see a kid running to the fence and go the opposite way. No, he comes to the fence too. And he's standing there on the other side of the fence and his nostrils are flaring and there's wind. (laughs) I'm just, you know, the chicken skin's up on my back and I'm completely mesmerized. And that was kind of it. You know, that was the beginning of my obsession. Although, you know, I forgot about it and carried on. And so I never went back to horses until I was an adult with children of my own. Oh, wow. That was definitely the first encounter. Well, the first encounter sounded like the things movies are made of that horse girls fall in love with, you know, the regals, you know, horse on the knoll with the wind blowing through its hair and coming up to the girl. I mean, that's like, what a connection that must have been. So, so the love was there. And now you're an adult horse owner. Can you tell us a little bit about your furry friends and and what you're doing with your your adult horse life? (laughs) Well, I come from a background of holistic health care for people. So that's what I ended up studying. And I got a business degree. I went to university. And then through a series of unfortunate circumstances, which I won't get into, but we all have those uh, challenges in our lives. I was forced to kind of reassess my life and, you know, what do I really want? 
like, mm -hmm. okay, hold on a second. Everything is going way too fast. And I need to stop right now and say, what's the meaning in my life? Mm -hmm. And what kept coming up for me is how my love of horses. <laughs> so I took my two young boys. Eli was only three months old. Moved out here to the country, went to a local horse show and said, who here can teach me how to ride? And that's how it all began. And I mentioned my background of holistic health care because I quickly realized that horses, well, the horses in this barn and, and these people were not doing anything they didn't think was right. Mm -hmm. But they had a level of discomfort that I I started to question. So there, there were issues, you know, like sweet itch and, and weaving and, you know, stomping and just little niggly things. And when I started to say like, this doesn't look like National Geographic, <laughs> they basically say, you know what, this is part and parcel of horse ownership. So just don't worry about it. Hmm. Which only piqued my curiosity further. And that's when I started to question what was really going on and and I thought well what's the difference between National Geo and these domestic horses and it, it seemed like the big difference was that we put saddles on and ride them mm. so it was probably an issue with their back I assume so through a lot of help with veterinarians and and scanning machines I developed a range of saddle pads that helps with saddle fit problems. But that didn't really solve all those niggly problems that, that horses had. Um, so I, that's when I had to start looking at the feet. It just occurred to me that nailing metal shoes, nailing metal uh, into live tissue might not be the answer. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, the hoofs are small compared to a thousand pounds of weight coming down. So I thought, well, how does the hoof function landing on metal? And when it lands on metal on a hard surface, doesn't it send shock back up the structure? So I started asking these sorts of questions. And it was around this time, Carly, that, <laughs> that I got ostracized because I was asking too many questions. Like the whole back issue was kind of acceptable, you know, develop a range of saddle pads and make them feel better with saddle fit. And that was acceptable, but don't be questioning a 1500 year old tradition of nailing metal into horses feet. And in this barn, the farrier, uh, the, there was, they were a couple and the woman was the trainer and the husband was the farrier. Mm -hmm. and they didn't want me rocking the boat and in fact neither did the people in the barn because they didn't want to start questioning either I mean it opened up a whole can of worms you know by this time I had purchased my own horse Rocky and Rocky was a barrel horse and all Rocky wanted to do was run flat out like <laughs> Now I understand the reason for this is because when he was running flat out, there were so many endorphins coursing through his body that he couldn't feel the pain that he was experiencing, these underlying conditions that he had. But by this time, I loved this boy. And I said, I'm not going to put up with being in a situation where he's not getting turnout. He's blanketed all the time. He's getting a diet of alfalfa and who knows what else. And they're not answering my questions. Hmm. So I took my horse to my friend's house. A uh, day later, uh, yeah, about 24 hours later, this boy could not walk. I phoned the vet. What's wrong with my horse? He said, well, did you give him his bute, his phenobutazol fien today? <laughs> I said, what phenobutazol? He said, well, this horse gets a pretty healthy dose. And I was such a novice. I said, why? And he said, well, he's got ring bone, side bone, splints, and arthritis. That probably sent off a ton of alarm bells in your head, right? Mm. So it, which led you to exploring, um, and I'm so fascinated about this because it is kind of, people are really starting to talk about this now. And you, and you started your company, Cavallo uh, Horse and Rider Inc., which develops and manufactures and distributes horse products in 28 countries worldwide. Can you share a little bit with us about 
evolution of your company and and where you went from Rocky's diagnosis and bringing him to your friend's house and being concerned about his health to starting this company? So, you know, Rocky was, had some issues and that the butte uh, ended up causing the compl complication of stomach ulcers. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know how to deal with it. If I knew uh, then what I know now, he'd still be here. But at the time, uh, the, the vet was very kind. He said, I'll take him off your hands and administer the drugs. And, and three months later, he had to put him down. And, and, you know, your first horse, your first love broke my heart. Mm. And so that was the pivot right there. It's like, hang on a second. I'm going to find out what the heck's going on with horses. Mm. Because it wasn't just Rocky. Like Rocky had problems, but those horses in that barn, and when I looked around, I could see other horses had problems too. And, you know, I, I, I developed the therapeutic saddle pad, but that, that didn't answer the whole question. So I went on to get many, well, not many, but I went on to get four more horses and mm -hmm. couldn't keep any of them 100% sound 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. I thought it was training, so I did all the training. I mean, I'm a good rider. <laughs> A good horsewoman. And that wasn't it either. So then I thought, okay, it must be breeding. So I pulled all my resources, got the best bred horse. Mm -mm, that wasn't it either. Couldn't keep her 100% sound 100% of the time. Now bear in mind, it wasn't just trail riding. I mean, I was a competitive barrel racer. So that, that's a lot of strain on horses. But even so, I didn't understand why I couldn't keep them sound. And then one day, another pivot was like an epiphany. I'm out there and the farrier comes to put, nail the shoes on, this teeny little hoof, he's clamping the metal shoes on. And I said, uh-uh, take them off. This doesn't intuitively, again, from my background of holistic healthcare, it just doesn't make sense. And I got some pushback about it. And I said, well, it's okay because I'm going away for a while. So, you know, she can just be barefoot because she's not getting ridden anyway. In fact, I was going away. I was going to promote my saddle pads at the British Equestrian Trade Association, which at that time was the biggest uh, trade fair for equestrian equipment in the world. And it's just outside of London and Birmingham. And fortuitously, while I was there, there was this man with this contraption um and i said it, you know it looked like a bell boot but it had a soul mm -hmm. and i said what's this you know and he says well it takes the place of metal horseshoes <laughs> like, oh, perfect yeah you know, tell me more <laughs> um so i said okay awesome like my company can uh, I did have a distribution company, so I kind of missed that part, a distribution company with my saddle pads and horse blankets and, you know, just some standard horse equipment. And I was distributing in Canada and the U.S., just North America. And I said, uh, can I take these home and try these on my horse? And I did. And they worked like she liked them. And that was that was the beginning of it. Now, at that time, uh, the contraption was called Old Max mm -hmm. and they were really cumbersome and really clunky and everything else. But, you know, I went about to, to the trade shows and I talked to people about it and I said, is there any interest in something like this? And there appeared to be, and if not specifically for uh, barefoot horses, then at least for therapy, for pulling a, a, a shoe, you know, mm -hmm. as a spare tire, for protection and breeding and all, you know, all those other injuries, all those other purposes. So I got busy and started distributing this old Mac boot through North America. But, you know, to be honest, it wasn't really a great boot. Like it was bulky and it had a couple of issues like with straps and stuff that were counterproductive. Mm. So this was in 2005. So I redesigned the boot, uh, patented it, took it under my umbrella, and uh, that's the beginning of Cavallo. And 
I knew it was going to be hard and it really was. And a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort and energy. And at this point, I'm glad for it. But if you would have asked me five years ago, was it all worth it? <laughs> if I had known how hard it was going to be, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but now it's really gaining some traction. And people are looking at, and, and I've gone all over the world and spoke, spoken at horse shows and educating people about the benefits of barefoot, mm -hmm. you know, blood circulation, proper shock absorption. So it, it's a combination of the education and then the distribution made a lot of mistakes in distribution in terms of who I aligned with. And it's really important. Like the, the people, <laughs> the people are so important and the relationships are so important. And some people would, you know, I was, you know, relatively naive um, and some people would promise me a lot. You know, I can do this for you. I can get these boots out into like everyone in Europe. Just give me the exclusivity or something like that. And, and you know, I would. And, and then it would turn out that they just, it would be another skew, another item in their catalog of 3,500 items. And I'd get lost, but I'd be tied up with them for a year. Oh, wow. So I made a few mistakes. Uh, but again, in the last good five years, I've found the right people who I love, who know, like, and trust, mm. and we're aligned with them. So it's, it's become a success. Now, uh, in the last two years, 30 other actual boots have popped up on the market. So the competition's there. And I'm glad for it because it grows the options that the rider has, and it makes hoof boots as an option to nailing metal shoes onto horses feet a real viable choice that yeah. the rider can make yeah there's like a there's a movement happening and this is this is more a part of dialogue in the horse world than it's been before and i love that you said you're glad for it that there's other competitors in the field because it's what i'm hearing you say is that you know you're in it for the bettering of the horses lives and then so the riders can have a better experience with their animals and know that their animals aren't in pain. And I think that that is really a beautiful way to do business is to think of it that way. I really commend you for that. You've written books on this topic, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about what it means to take care of a horse's hoof naturally, you know, and, and why you promote that barefoot it, with the use of the boots is like a better solution is better for, for the horse's health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, when the hoof, tiny little hoof, bears the weight of a thousand pounds of horse, something has to happen, and we call it hoof mechanism. Mm. And what happens is the coffin bone drops like a trampoline to absorb shock. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's hydraulics. <laughs> but when it's clamped with a metal shoe, that can't happen. So where is the shock then absorbed? either in the sensitive tissue of the hoof, and that's where you get your ring bone, side bone splints, further up the structure, arthritis, you know, all kinds of problems develop from that. And you know what? Like, just consider two things about timing. One is, horses have been on the planet for 50 million years. <laughs> the hoof is not a design flaw mm -hmm. that we have to correct with metal shoes that have been the same for 1500 years it's the same thing and we haven't changed it like look at everything else has changed and yet we're still nailing metal into a horse's feet so yes but we do need protection in riding because our horses are domestic animals and they don't you know that beautiful picture in your background there of these wild horses running around yeah you know that's that's what 50 million years of evolution is all about. And they're domestic now, you know, they're confined and, and sometimes the ground that they're on is very different from what we want to ride on. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, the hoof gets used to the ground that it's on and then we want to ride on asphalt or rocky trails or blah, blah, blah. Additionally, we put 200, well, that's the average weight of rider and tack on the horse's back. So it further compresses the sole into the ground. 
So do we need protection when we're riding horses? Yes. Does it come in the form of nailing metal shoes onto their feet so that they can't feel? Now, the reason your horse seems sound when he's got metal nailed into his feet is because he can't feel his feet very much. Hmm. Because he's got no hoof expansion and contraction, that hoof mechanism, that pumping action isn't functioning. So he can't feel his feet. Hmm. But, but the problems still go on the ring bones, eye bones, splints, pedal osteitis, all that stuff, calcification, navicular laminitis, all still happens because the blood isn't circulating. Now, when you pull the metal shoes off and the blood starts circulating again, he can feel his feet and he may be tender, mm -hmm. you know, to start with. Mm -hmm. Horses are meant to move. So you really have to move him and get that blood circulating again with all the nutrients and the oxygen mm -hmm. that provides the healing properties for whatever has been brewing in that hoof as a result of clamping. So movement is imperative. If they're not comfortable, they're not going to be moving. So you have to put boots on, put cavallos on so that they can be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then you can ride over any terrain at any speed. And that makes a whole lot of sense because if you think about the domesticated horse and what we're riding in, we're riding in soft sand without a whole lot of rocks that, you know, we finally grade, grade for our pasture. So they're not getting like the wild horses in the picture behind me. They're not getting that different terrain and the different textures. Mm -hmm. So their feet aren't accustomed to it. You know, it's like if you want, if a human being walked uh, barefoot over rocks and like on the beach and then, you know, on the hard ground or whatever, we would develop calluses to protect our feet. So I imagine it's sort of a similar deal that's going on with horses just to summarize what you what you said there right you've got to be riding that horse daily on that terrain for that hoof to condition mm -hmm. it saddens me when i see riders barefoot and the horse is looking for the soft shoulder looking for the soft ground like Put the night, I mean, I call them Nike sometimes, you know, because it's a good comparison. Put the running shoe on. Yeah, Give and your horse the comfort, protection, safety, you know, traction. Thus enter your boot, which is like the perfect solution to, to both worlds, which, which is great. Which, and you are phenomenally educated on these topics, which led you to write a couple books. So can you talk to us about, about the books you've written and share sort of the inspiration behind bringing these books to life? The first book, uh, There Are No Horseshoes in Heaven, <laughs> was mining my, um, I want to say my, my spiritual life with my horse life. Mm. And what I recognized is that having a level of consciousness in your being is really important to your success with horses because horses are such intuitive animals what you bring into their space they pick up but if you don't know what you're bringing into their space you know they you might not have success with them so so you know consciousness comes through uh things like knowing about your breathing patterns, right? Am I breathing right now? You know, people hold their breath all the time when they're around horses, mm -hmm. you know, and horses can pick up that tension, you know, so you breathe, you know, you uh, uh, practice, a mindful practice of breathing is really helpful to being around horses. And it's really helpful to you too, to sort of center and, and ground yourself and, and, have some control or at least some awareness of all the thoughts that are going around in your head. Like say, you know, you had a bad day at work or something like your horse doesn't care if, if you know, somebody spilled coffee on you or, or, you know, if your boss is down on you or if you just lost an account, you know, when you walk into your horse's face, you have an opportunity to let all that go and just let your horse mirror back what you're putting out mm -hmm. and that's consciousness that's awareness mm -hmm. and so I wanted to write a book about about that and about how important it is to practice awareness and practice calmness and practice being centered and 
you know, and then the yoga, you know, the yoga comes into that too, because flexibility is so important and understanding, you know, the vascular system and, and the, and the muscular system helps, you know, this awareness of the body, the awareness of the mind, the awareness of the breath. When you're aware of your, all these things, you can have a dance with your horse. You can give your horse the correct cues so that he understands you and you're moving together with him. So Go Horses on the Journey was, was like an attempt to educate people about themselves and their horses. And, you know, it's about, it, it's about taking a profound experience of life with horses and, and combining it with a mindful practice. Oh, and, I love that. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then this new book is, is a little bit more practical and it's called um, Hoofprints on the Journey and it's a compilation in my witnessing of, of the experts around the world and the stories that horse people are telling about their experiences with this new, you know, this is the biggest evolution that we will see in our lifetimes about horse husbandry. I mean, we are saying, hang on a second, this 1,500-year-old tradition may not be the best thing. And it's a groundswell of people looking at that. So, so it's kind of taking that, witnessing and documenting what's happening around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, with rising feed costs, increased vet bills, increased farrier bills, encroaching urban development, uh, you know, the overall stress. I mean, that's just some of the frustrations facing horse owners right now. And, and worries about your horse's soundness and well-being is certainly there too. We've all been humbled by, by our horse's lamenesses or, or sicknesses or our lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. And so this book is about prevention primarily, and it, it gives you some real actionable steps that you can take um, to prevent and cure some of the ailments uh, that are going on with your horse and and it's it's not rocket science you know it's it's you know once you consider some of the statements from the top experts and other horse owners you can understand and prevent problems from arising and um you know things like um climate change and you know weird patterns in and different ways of keeping your horse and it's it's a quick and easy read it's full of pictures and graphics and and hopefully you know entertaining it's it's not heavy like it's for the it's for the the layman you know it's yeah and it and it's to help you understand that you're not powerless like there's a couple of choices you can make to really control the destiny of your horse's well-being oh. I love that. And, and I do, I'm, I'm so grateful for, to you for writing a book like this that helps educate horse owners who really care, care, care so much about the, the well-being of their, their horses. And I think all horse owners do so much, but that is the thing, like, how do we educate ourselves about things that we feel like we don't, we don't know or we didn't grow up learning, right? So you, you put it together and you packaged it and you talk to other experts so people have a resource to go to that's easy to read and easy to understand with pictures describing things. I mean, what a contribution. Not only are you bringing the conversation about the boots forward and being barefoot and protecting our animals' bodies, but you're, you're writing material to help people understand it even better. So thank you for that. Uh, and 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 you you speak on these topics too. You're also a public speaker, um, and you share comprehensive personal knowledge of the natural horse world with your audiences. So you know how how did you get involved with public speaking? Like how does one you know ask you to come to an event and share what you know? How how did how did you decide you wanted to take that that jump after having written your books? I didn't want to take it. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> Did not. Public speaking scared me half to death. I think it was horrid. Yeah, it's like the number one fear. People would rather die than public speak. So I'm always curious to learn how people like That's really just right. went for it and took it on. <laughs> right. They'd rather hear their obituary than public speak. <laughs> 
the thing is, I felt like if I wasn't going to do it, if I wasn't going to say it, it wasn't going to get said. Mm. I, you know, and, and I mean, I was put down, I was ostracized, I was humbled, you know, the barriers really didn't like me for a while. Uh, that's all changed now because, you know, nobody's in it to hurt horses, right? So it doesn't have to be this us and them scenario. But, um, you know, it was hard. But I, I just felt like if I didn't do it, nobody would. You know, a couple of times I cried. And, then, and a couple of times people in the audience cried. And when that started to happen, I realized that my message was real, you know. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, You've just changed everything that I thought was true, but I knew in my gut anyway. So it, it connected to, on a deep level with people. And I think what a lot of people realized is that they could have saved a few horses' lives if they'd have had that information. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, are, you are a messenger. You took on public speaking anyway, and you, you went out there and you shared what, what you knew with other horse lovers so they can help their animals and eventually hopefully we'll all you know save some lives so for for someone who's interested in learning more about natural hoof care and about how to use your boots your company has a youtube channel where there's some information can you talk to us a little bit about what's available on your youtube channel for people who are, who are interested in in what you're talking about here with us today we keep adding more information all the time the latest thing that we just got this week was the first only independent study by a university comparing Cavallo hoof boots uh, to metal shoes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and this is, we're just putting it, I think it goes on, it goes live tomorrow. Um, and they did it with Fuji film, you know, the weight of Fuji film and the distribution of weight of Fuji film. And they compared mm -hmm. uh, metal shoes to hoof boots. And Cavella boots came out on top and they're highly recommending them. So, you know, that's one aspect of, of what's, what's available in terms of information. There's, there's lots of experts talking about their use of our boots, you know, Pat Pirelli, Pat Pirelli speaks freely about using them on trail rides when nothing else worked. And, and in fact, I will say, because he says it, he says he had some trials and tribulations with other boots and he says, Cavallos are the ones. Pat Pirelli, John Lyons, the Double Dans, uh, Julie Goodnight, they're all on our website under the experts page talking about their experiences um, with our boots. So there's that. And then there's lots of, you know, regular horse people documenting their experiences as well. You, you'll find it interesting. If you go over to our YouTube channel, if you go, there's a wealth of information on our website too, mm -hmm. under the blogs and under experts pages and things to know. I think we have a lot of stories that you can relate to. That's wonderful. And you know, I got lost uh, on your YouTube channel and I got lost on your website looking through all the information is really fascinating. I'm curious for the listeners that are listening to the show. So for example, say I decided I want to do this. I mean, obviously we need to educate ourselves. We have to do it right. We have to work with our farrier because the horses still need to be trimmed and, and all of that. But say someone wants to get into a pair of Cavallo boots, how does it work? Can you give us like a, a five minute download on how the process would work? How does it look? Yeah, um, you pull the metal shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. You pull one. the metal shoes off and you measure. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have several styles. They go from like the teeny little minis, which we just started doing because what we discovered is a lot of these minis are, are used as therapy horses. You know, they're going into extended care homes and hospitals and stuff like that. And they're sliding mm -hmm. on the floors. And so they needed protection too. So now we've got a range of mini boots and then all the way to the draft horses. I mean, you know, from a business perspective, it's very expensive to develop the molds. Each size has a specific mold. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really, we weren't too excited to 
to do the minis and the drafts because, you know, they're the far opposite ends of the spectrum and, you know, the, the most boots. I mean, obviously, if you're in business, you have to make some money to stay in business, right? Mm -hmm. And the most boots being sold are in a certain range. But those draft horses, those big guys, you know, pulling those carriages out on the streets, they needed protection too. So we go all the way from mini to draft and everything in between. And there's a, a regular size and then there's a narrow size because some hoofs are, you know, long and narrow. Hinds tend to be narrower than fronts. You know, fronts, the front hoofs take 70% of the horse's load. So they mm. tend to spread out a little bit more. And often most of the conditions manifest in the front end too. You mm. know, laminitis and navicular disease almost always in the front. So you can get away. A lot of people just use boots on the fronts and leave the backs. The backs are for propulsion. Mm -hmm. You know, where the fronts are the, are the fulcrum, they take the weight. So a lot of people just use boots on the front. Mm -hmm. so you pull off the shoes, you get a good trim. It's really important. Uh, you know, the trimming, there's, there's various schools of thought on how to trim. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say the most important thing is that you can relate to your trimmer. And that you don't feel like you're, you know, they're condescending when you ask questions and you want to know. So you need to be somewhat involved and understand the process mm -hmm. of the trimming. Because what you're trying to do is emulate what happens in that wild horse environment. Mm -hmm. You know, because that wild horse environment is what kept those horses on the planet for 50 million years. So you're trying to emulate that hoof function mm -hmm. with the trim. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important for horses to move because of the blood circulation. So how you keep horses is, is pretty important too. They need some hydration. You know, we've done a lot of things differently in our domestic environment. You know, we feed them water in buckets, whereas in a wild horse environment, they'd go and stand in a watering hole or a creek or something and hydrate themselves internally when they're thirsty, but also hydrate their hooves so that their hooves develop elasticity and strength and flexibility. So, you know, if you're living in a dry environment, you know, maybe you put a, 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 a run a hose in, in some mud where they have to stand to feed, you know, so there are little things like that mm -hmm. that you have to think, okay, what happens in a wild horse environment that I can emulate in my environment? And lots of us don't have like, you know, 10 acres Never mind 20 or 200, you know, lots of us are on two or five acres. Mm -hmm. And so how do we encourage our horses to move in that? Well, there's a thing called paddock paradise. And what it is, is it's a fence within a fence. And you can just run a wire within your fence line. And turns out that if horses have somewhere to go, they'll move. <laughs> if they're standing in a field, they'll stand there forever. <laughs> But if you give them a channel like a pathway, they'll move along it. Very and interesting. You can help facilitate that by putting food in different places and water in different places. And then, you know, if you have if you have more than one horse, they'll propel each other along. And and so this is the way you can get horses moving in your domestic environment. So you've got trimming, you've got hydration, you've got movement. You know, they really need each other. Mm. Like keeping one horse is just wrong, <laughs> you know. And by the way, when they're barefoot on their living environment, you don't have to worry about them kicking each other and injuring each other when they're out together because a bare hoof doesn't do anywhere near the damage that a metal shoe would. Mm -hmm. So you pull the metal shoes off, you get a good trimmer, you consider these other things, and then you measure for some boots and you're ready to go. So right on. So so it's one pair of boots. You don't have to buy like various sizes or different sizing. So basically you measure for the boot and then you those are the boots that you use. And they I'm sure they last for a very long time, right? It's like a one time sort of investment thing. So in so in the long run, it's better for the animal. It's more like mimicking how they would be in the wild. And it will also save you money because getting your horses shot is is very very expensive so so basically you're investing in the boots once 
And then you just have to maintain them through their trims, which is much more cost effective. Is, is that right? You nailed it. <laughs> I love this conversation because like what I'm really hearing is your, your passion for your business and for what you're creating because of the difference that it's making. It's so, and you're so educated. It, it's so, it rings like a bell in your mess, you know, as you're speaking. So, and I'm curious because this is, it's like a passion. It's a dream. It was a little hard along the way. What, advice would you offer to anyone who wants to follow their dreams or create their life that the, the way they want to, like how you did around the Kavala boot, the boot project? Well, you have to trust yourself. Mm. You have to trust yourself to discover who you really are. And then you have to go on the path that, and find that out. And sometimes you have to dig pretty deep. And it's not about listening to others because there'll be a lot of naysayers out there. Mm -hmm. Like I remember my father, don't be ridiculous. Like, you know, horses eat while you sleep. <laughs> you can't, you can't go into a business about horses. You'll go broke for sure. Blah, blah, blah. So, and when I mean dig deep, I mean, you, you, you kind of have to find that, that quiet spirit that resides in all of us and go to the soul and ask yourself and there's four questions four mm. questions who am i who really am i and i will say universally we're all kind of the same because the spirit runs through all of us so who am i what do i want what do i really really want and how you determine what you really really want is just reflect on what, it, what you do that makes time stand still. Mm. You know, you may have to go way back into your childhood, I don't know, but there is certain things that you have done in your life that makes time stand still. And that's what you want. You wanna go to that place where whatever you're doing, you know, the rest of the world is out because you're resonating with your inner being with what you really want and your soul's purpose. And then, you, you know, you've got to listen, like what and, and how can I use that? What am I here to do with that? Because, you know, business isn't easy <laughs> and there's a lot of ups and downs. So you have to find the inner strength within yourself and, and the commitment within yourself. And you can't find it through... Oh, you know, I think I should be an accountant because it's a good job. Mm. No, it's got to come from the truth of who you are as a real person. And um, you can find that out. You just have to listen. That is fabulous advice. And, and I think you summed it up perfectly. I wanted to touch on this too, because this is really fabulous and it's so clear why. But you won the Royal Bank of Canada Western Trailblazer Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award. I mean, congratulations. Uh, tell us a little bit about this award and like, how did you feel when you were, were recognized that way? Well, very humble, very humble. Like I was in the company of scientists and captains of industry and, and people who held 50 patents, you know. So and I was just a girl from Roberts Creek, <laughs> you know, who loved horses and had a thing. <laughs> you know? So to be honest, it felt it felt a bit unreal. I've gotten over it now because what it was is an imposter. I felt like I didn't belong. Mm. And I'm over it now because I've stepped up to the plate and and I belong here. Mm. And you know, there are certain stigmas that we just project. And they're completely irrelevant. <laughs> Magic happens when you follow your passion and you are a clear, you know, clear example of that. And, you know, imposter syndrome is very real for a lot of people. I, I, I experience it with, you know, who am I to be a writer? Who am I to create this podcast and talk with such amazing people like yourself? You know, it's, it's there, I think, for all of us. It's like in every human being, right? And you're, you you climb the mountain and got to the other side of imposter syndrome and, and you just are being now with who you are. And that is so cool. Is there any one particular way of reaching either readers of your books or, or buyers of your boots it, that really, really works well for you? Well, it's right now it's gotta be social media. 
Mm. It's got to be social media where, you know, I, I really love Facebook. It allows a conversation between others as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's really important because that social proof, you know, it's not just us, the company talking about it. It's, it's other riders. So I think that's the most valid conversation that we can have. I mean, I can go and I can present and I can do podcasts and I can do webinars and I can write books, but you know, still it's, it's me, the company to some degree. And so I think the most solid uh, strength we have right now is social media and, and creating conversations between others. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff that comes in, and I'm talking about a daily basis, mm. not only on Facebook, but on Instagram, on our chat rooms, on our emails, you know, people tell us stories that are really moving and it's from, you know, it's global. Mm. and it's strong really love that you mentioned the social proof that you're generating through social media and your and your different you know marketing channels because you know testimonials really are kind of the future like people are looking for for that sort of thing so and you're building it right there that's a great point uh for you what has been the best part about your entrepreneurial journey freedom mm. freedom <laughs> you know, and with freedom comes responsibility, obviously, because the buck stops here. <laughs> so if I screw up, but I'm willing to take that because I have the freedom to make the kind of choices that I want. I have the freedom to to work with the customers I want. If I don't, if I don't know, like, and trust you, I don't want to work with you. You know, I've got that freedom. And at the end of the day, I decide. I have freedom of choice. That's the best part. That is awesome. And then I always like to ask this question too of other authors. So, so in your author journey, what 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 was the the hardest part for you in getting you know your author career going? And then what was the best part? You know, that's it's such a fun balance to hear the difference between the two. You know, people say that the writing is hard and they can't discipline themselves to write or whatever. That wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part was actually getting it out because I felt like I was burying my soul. <laughs> and so then it was like, well, what if nobody likes me? <laughs> You're right. What if nobody likes me? Mm -hmm. And and they say, this is a pile of BS. <laughs> you know? And then I put my heart and soul because I have, because that's who I am. You know, I mean, you know, it, it just all comes out. And they don't like it. So that would be the absolute hardest part because it took, I, I kept stalling on publishing. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. You know, wanting to revise it and get it perfect. But the reality it was, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's never, it's never a hundred percent. It's never a hundred percent ready. Um, but you got to get over the fear. Yeah, how did you do that? Because I do agree, you have to you have to just do it, and then and then if there's something that comes up, you can go back and and fix it. But sometimes the biggest hurdle is just doing it and then moving forward. How did how did you get over that fear? How, did do you do anything special to like just say, ah, I'm gonna just do it? <laughs> you know, I have to say I have the best coach on the planet, mm. who is my husband, and he just he is my He's my cheering squad. He's my champion. He's got my back. He respects and admires me and promotes me. And, and if I fall flat on my butt, he's there to pick me up. So I owe a lot to him. And, uh, and finally, at the end, he, it was him. He just pushed, said, sat me down and said, you know you're procrastinating because you're afraid. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you are. And so you have to do it. Oh, that's great. And then you had a you have a trusted advisor who is your who just happens to be your husband and he gave you the the little nudge you needed to to just put it into the world. And and we all need that person. You know, we all needed a trusted advisor that we can go to that'll give us a little bit of coaxing when we need it. <laughs> and then on the flip side of all that, and, and good on you and for just doing it and putting it out there. I think those words are really gonna resonate with some aspiring authors and even 
some already published authors who are going to be listening into this podcast. So on the flip side of that, what's been the very best thing? I always love to hear this too. There's always more. <laughs> Once you start writing, there's always more to write. So it's just, it opens up a whole world. And you realize you have something to say, so it validates you. So it's really exciting from that perspective in that, in that there's always more and, you, and, and you're validating yourself. That I, I feel like when I get something written down, I've validated something that I think about. And uh, so I think it provides some self-esteem and some confidence. Absolutely. That is a beautiful answer. And Carol, I have so enjoyed our time together. I have just absolutely adored this conversation. I love your connectedness. I, I love what you're doing for horses. I love the advice that you've shared for, for fellow authors on the show. Would you let listeners know where they can find you, your company, and your books? Well, the company is Cavallo, C-A-V-A-L-L-O. And so you just Google Cavallo Hoof Boots and <laughs> everything will appear. <laughs> and then come visit us, you know, come visit the website. We've got some beautiful information up there and uh, we have a live chat and, and, you know, you can certainly send us an email and give us a call toll free in North America. And I, I think all the information that, that you need is, is going to be on that website. And we're, we're here happy to talk to you. And I have to tell you that we have the best team all here manning the phones, manning the internet with the best advice, you know, and, and some of them have been in, well, Crystal, who is the expert, she's been here for over 10 years. So she really knows what's going on and she can really help you um, with whatever your questions or concerns or anything you might have. That's wonderful. And then your books, I imagine, are anywhere books are sold, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, can get them clearly from the Cavallo website. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Cavallo website, all of the above. <laughs> Wonderful. And I will make sure to link to all those places in your show notes so people can get directly to you and your books. But I wanted to make sure to mention them at the end of the show for people who might just be listening so they can Google you right away. And Carol, I have so enjoyed the gift of your time. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. I think it's, it's just wonderful that you're doing this too, Carly. I really appreciate it as well. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes. And make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle. <laughs>